Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench we have a couple of boxes that are what they say on the tin. I have uh, been talking about this and kind of wrestling with getting this video out there. A lot of people have been asking for this video about uh, calibrating a scope with a function generator and this is part one of that video. There will be a part two. In this case there are two function generators here. Uh, both of them are from Rigel or Regal, however you pronounce it. And um, in this video, I'm going to go into why I picked these units, some of the issues we're going to have using a function generator to calibrate in a line of scope. I'm going to switch on some of the faster gear in the lab, really take a look at these, see what they're going to do, and some challenges of doing a scope cal with function generators. What's in the box is upgrading two of these, or these units in the lab. Uh, these are some TM500 units, but uh, these are two megahertz function generators, and I've talked about it in the past, but for people that are just finding this video, they are woefully insufficient for aligning or calibrating a scope, and I wasn't even going to attempt to use these to do that. Not what they were made to do. Um, However, I was really limited by their 2 megahertz of analog bandwidth. I am going to keep them in the lab, uh, this 507. I haven't actually seen very often, and they're both working just fine. For some low, uh, low speed, not low end, low speed sweeping functions. So I will keep them. The other thing is, even these brand new Rigel units, they have some limitations that I'm going to have to work around where for some specific use cases, these are actually a little bit better. Um, the outputting waveform on these, even though they're slower at 2 megahertz, I actually get more voltage out of these than I do out of the Rigels because they're topped out at, if I remember correctly, 10 volts. So I will get some boxes open, and I will be back with what we are adding to the lab. And here we go. So, we have a DG4162. This is middle of the road in the older style of the Rigel instruments. There's three systems, or three lines above this, and so this is pretty much middle of the road. The 162 in the 4000 series is the 160 megahertz version, which is going to be important later, whereas the DG2102 is the top end of the 16-bit units. There's really two, two lines in the 16-bit, from what I can tell, is the 2000 series and the 900 series. For whatever reason, they are really really close to each other like the the 900 series and the 2000 series it's kind of hard to spot the differences in the two and they're also priced very close to each other as well so i picked these up from tequipment.net uh no, nobody sponsored these channels rigel didn't send these to me t equipment didn't send these to me if anybody's curious as to what they have i will leave a link in the description below not to these i don't even have affiliate links no, uh, none of that just to their website so people can check them out um, when talking to them on the phone and calling them those guys are great to talk to a lot of the technicians you end up with they use this equipment in the um, outside of the office so they can really help figure out the differences like that as to where two very similar pieces of equipment are and help pick one both of these are arbitrary, 16-bit DAC, 14-bit DAC. Uh, counters in each. I haven't even started these up, I so I'm going to end up using these for the first time. And we'll go through that. But why two? So I couldn't get faster than 100 megahertz on the DG2000 series or the 900 series, they top out at 100 megahertz. Needed something a little bit quicker. 
Also, the modulation that this can do is more than what this can do. So I have a lot more modulation options with the DG4000 series than I do with the 2000 series, which is going to become important in future videos. I have uh, some radios that I need to align uh, that are AM and FM, and I have been struggling to do an FM alignment because I don't have an FM source. My HP, which I use for radio alignments, it does AM only. Well, that doesn't help me for FM, but it does have modulation. So part of what I'm planning on doing is I will be modulating the the carrier wave will be generated by the HP. These guys will be doing the FM modulation for me, or one of the two. That's hopefully how that's going to work. You guys will ride along with me for that. So, so on the back of these units, we have the usual um, USB, LAN. And this is one of the important parts, uh, USB and LAN as well. This is one of the important parts for the 2000 series that I wanted to grab because I can use the rubidium, which I am planning on using for both of these units. I'm going to configure them for 10 megahertz in, and these are going to get two spots on the rubidium frequency standard. That's just going to stabilize the clocks and tighten up the frequencies. So when I ask for a frequency from one of these units, I should be very, very close. We'll test that actually when I get these fired up, as well as look at some of the critical scope calibration parameters uh, a little bit later. We'll have to turn on some of the faster gear for that. The other neat thing about these is on this one, the counter input is on the front. They both have frequency counters in it. I believe, if I remember the spec sheet correctly, they're both seven-digit frequency counters, which is pretty good. Uh, my scope only goes to, I think, four or five, so you get two extra digits of resolution on there. We'll check the accuracy as well because I can, I can uh, smash my GPSDO into the front end of these, and we can do a count based on the rubidium standard. And so any errors we see should be these guys, because they shouldn't see any errors in the GPSDO, because it's, um, it's modulating below seven digits. So if everything is correct, there should be zero perceptible error in that. So the counter on here is on the back. Counter on here is on the front. Um, I actually kind of like that. I think what I'm going to end up doing is I have some vertical outputs on some of the scopes. I think I, I, I'm thinking I'm going to permanently wire uh, one of the vertical outputs into the counter because it's a buffered. Whatever the uh, front end of the scope is seeing, you get a buffered signal at the vertical output, and that'll let me feed a a counter for that. So. If I can do that, that'll be cool. That'll add a, a um, frequency counter to one of my older analog scopes, probably the 7603 if I can do it, because the 7854 has a counter once I get that configured. I have to order some BNC cables. I did not think about that, so we'll be getting some BNC cables to hook these guys up, which is fine. Nice carry handle. There's actually, th this unit's actually got a decent amount of um, of weight to it. And, okay, good. They both have knobs. Sometimes adjusting parameters, dialing parameters back and forth is very good. This has a soft button, though. I wonder what its parasitic draw is going to be. This has a hard power button, so it's off and on. Uh, we'll test what the parasitic draw on this one's going to be. I don't know if this has an OCXO. If it's um, heating one of those up, I uh, will give that a check because that'll be apparent in the current draw of the device. So let me get the uh, power cords plugged in, and we'll just turn them on and see what happens. Well, there is the parasitic draw on the 4100, or 4162. So it's pulling about one watt. I wouldn't expect that to be a heated OCXO, but um, that might help the boot time, though. Okay, here we go. Firing these up for the first time. Given that it's brand new gear, I would not expect there to be much excitement. 
Wow, that was fast. So it's got it, it must keep it must keep the CPU awake. That's what that one watt is. When it's on, it goes up to 21 watts. So there's clicks coming from the 2000. Uh, what came in the box? Uh, power cord, obviously. We got a USB cables, but I got to run network cables for these because I'll do everything through Cat5 other than USB. Did get some reasonably good BNC cables. Probably going to be a little short for what I want to do. Unfortunately, my lab is spreading out. It's like a gas. It keeps growing, which is fine. It's fun. All right, we are up on both. I missed it when it kicked over because I was taking the cable out. So what is this going to be? Four foot? Yeah, four foot cable, four footish cable. Um, kind of stiff. It'll hang out. Reasonable USB cable. Probably use it for the counter. Uh, hooking it up to a scope. Hopefully the shielding's good because, as we have discussed in past videos, my lab's kind of noisy. All right. Let's see. Oh, yeah, counter. Wow, that's actually got um, some decent information on it. Uh, looks like we may have a duty cycle. Um, yeah, uh, we all, it looks like we also have voltage. I'll have to see if that's peak-to-peak -peak or RMS. Probably RMS. Uh, what's the attenuation factor? Oh, I can actually put a 10x attenuator in the front end of the uh, counter. That's kind of convenient. High frequency suppression. Wow, that's actually a pretty uh, pretty nice counter function in the um, 4000. That will be useful. It only goes up to 250 megahertz, so I still need to rely on my uh, 53131. But uh, I may not have to have that on as much. That'll be nice. Okay, while I wait for the DSA to warm up, I have been generating data most of the day, and that is contained in here. We will go over this on these two guys. Uh, for those who want to take a look at a copy of the sheet, I'll be posting this to the EEV blog and a few other places, and I will leave a link in the description where this can be downloaded. Uh, I'll probably throw it up on my uh, Patreon page. Um, it'll be open. It won't be behind the paywall. So we'll go from there. Okay, let's talk about testing methodology. So what I did was I ran 500 samples at a five-second gate time on my function generator. Sorry, not function generator. My HP 53131, and I did it at 10 megahertz on for all the testing. So everything is apples to apples. Everything is set up the same. And I wanted to see how well things kind of did. And the results were kind of interesting. Um, the important specification that I'm most concerned with, especially if you're doing like a scope cal or something like that, would be the standard deviation on the clock. So that's where really these units are going to kind of differentiate themselves and they're going to kind of shine. Um, a couple of other testing I did was I did some voltage stability over time where I set up the 6500 to take 500 readings at 10 averages on AC and DC. Found out this guy can't do DC, but that guy can. So that is one difference between the two. Uh, I set for 3 volts DC. 5 volts RMS AC on both units, and the testing was the same. And I did the testing with and without references, not the voltage testing. The voltage testing was just with a reference. But um, actually, I did all three references. So the way uh, what we have, if you're looking at the sheet, is this first block. So we have the 4162, five-second gate time on the frequency counter, 500 samples of data for the statistics, uh, standard deviation was actually pretty awful um, for the internal clock. I, I mean, okay, we're at tens of millihertz, so pretty awful is relative. 
Um, but comparably, it was wandering around a little bit. Same thing was true for the uh, 2102, which was uh, where the it was about 13 millihertz. Um, the standard deviation on the on the 1202 was um, about 30 30 milli, uh, millihertz. So the the clock is definitely better on the um, or the, I should say the stock clock is better on the 4162 versus the 2102. Where things get really interesting is when you hook these things up to a reference, give them a, give them a better clock. Now, I have a rubidium standard in the lab, so I did the testing first on the rubidium, and then I did both tests again on a GPSDO. So if you didn't have rubidium and you only had a 10 megahertz GPSDO, um, I did the testing there as well. And in either case, feeding these a 10 megahertz reference tightened up the clock quite a bit. Um, my standard deviation on the 4162 got down to 45 microhertz. Standard deviation on the uh, 2102 got down to 554 microhertz. Not bad. Um, on the GPSDO, it fuzzed out a little bit on the 4162 at 92 microhertz. And the interesting thing was for the 2102, it actually did better on the GPSDO than it did on the Rubidium. So that's an interesting add. Now, as I'm going through some of this, this is not, if you, if you buy a 4162 from Rigel or a 2102, these are not guaranteed. These, these specifications are not guaranteed. These are tested for these two units specifically. The spec sheet that you get from Rigel is the absolute worst case scenario. Anything better than that is a bonus, but that's what the, that's what the units are guaranteed to do. So... Another interesting thing that I did was, because this was a sine wave, I kicked channel 2 to a 1 kilohertz 5-volt peak-to-peak sine wave. And as measured on my AA501, um, the 4162 was 0.01% THD. Actually, I do have the decimals, so that is, a, um, that is an accurate number as measured, because the THD meter is four digits. The... 2102 is 0.139% THD. So even though it has a better DAC, this has better sine wave performance. Now, there are also different classes. This is a 4000 series. That's a 200 series. There is some cost difference between the two. The cost difference from Rigel would say this is the more expensive unit, so this is the, quote, better one than that one. The data does seem to support that. So where I'm planning on using these in the lab, because these two were both purchased, they were not, I paid full price for them, they're not loans or anything like that. Uh, I'm going to hook them both up to my reference, and if you have a reference or have space on a reference for these, it definitely really helps them uh, dial in the accuracy, so would definitely recommend doing that. I'm going to use the 100 megahertz, the 2000 series, as more a general purpose instrument, and the 4000 series is going to be a kind of a more specialized use case. But I also understand not uh, everyone has two. Um, I did some voltage stability tests as well. On the 2102, I did a 5 volts RMS AC to 500 readings. I got a peak-to-peak -peak variance of 745 microhertz, which is not bad. That one actually beat the voltage stability on the 4162, which was a 1.35 millivolt difference. Although the standard deviation, yeah. So the 21, the 2102, where so where it, it kind of hashed out is this one has better voltage stability. That's probably that extra two bits in the DAC that we're seeing, um, but I can't say for sure. This one has a better clock stability, so the so the uh, 4000 series has a much better clock. This one has a better uh, output stability. Are they calibration level gear precision generators? No. Will they work for a scope? Probably. I'm actually starting to get kind of optimistic with these two units because um, 
if we're, if you're doing say a 400 series scope like a 465, the target's three percent. So we're well below three percent with some of these variances. So as long as you can check it, because the absolute set point accuracy wasn't that great. I was off by five millivolts DC when I set for three volts, but the stability was there. So you can always, with a meter, compensate out the the set point variance uh, as long as the stability is there. The stability is the important part. Uh, I'm going to let the um, DSA 602 finish warming up, and then we're going to um, take a look at some rise times. Okay, this waveform is from the 4162, and I have it set to 100 kilohertz at uh, 8 millivolts peak to peak into a 50 ohm load. We're using a 11A72, which is a 1 gigahertz plug in, and I'm getting a rise time of, of about 3.6. See if I can speed that up by slowing down the rep rate at all. Um, 10 kilohertz. Nah, 3.69. Not really. 100 kilohertz. Uh, although, wave shape, this looks really good. Square wave wise, this looks really good. Three nanoseconds, it's a little slower than like a PG, um, something like that. So it's going to struggle with the high frequency calibration, which I knew these were going to struggle with that. Um, that is one of the places where function generators kind of fall, fall a little bit short. But um, it's starting to look like it's kind of the only parameter where they're starting to fall a little bit short is doing some high frequency alignments. So. Yeah, everything is looking really, really good. Let me get set up on the um, 1202, and we'll see if that 16-bit uh, DAC shows shows some promise. Okay, here we are on the 2102, and the 16-bit DAC. We'll see how that ends up working. I can say I like setting high um, the output impedance on the 2102. It's easier to find than it is on the... Um, 4162. So, uh, that's just a UI kind of interface thing. But uh, let's spin this out real quick. We have good waveforms, not no real overshoot. Nice pulse. Dial this over. So the. 2102 is actually giving me a measured eh, 7.8, so it's a little slower than the um, 4162, but still, all in all, not good. I mean, I knew these were going to, uh, this is where they were going to kind of fall short. Now, this is easily, easily gotten around because everything else looks good. It's, uh, my initial feeling is it's going to go pretty well given a, um, one of these and a Leo Pulsar, which I have. I have a couple of his high-speed um, Pulsar circuits for um, from Leo. So I think that can help sharpen up this edge and uh, let it be so um, where the function generators are just kind of... Well, I'm asking them to do things they're not designed to do. So this is this is by no means a dig on Rigel or either of these two units. Actually, I'm very impressed with these two units, um, at least from initial impressions. I will see going down um, how much use they get on the bench and things like that, so keep an eye out for future videos. This is not a sponsored video. I would actually recommend not buying anything that you see in my videos unless you see them recurring multiple times. So... The way things kind of work is the bench is a functioning repair bench, and um, the stuff that gets used the most gets is the closest at hand. So as I'm working through repairs, things like that, I'm mentioning stuff. There's a lot of equipment on the wings that gets used very infrequently, very niche stuff um, 
when I need it, I need it, and nothing else will do. But it's not everyday drivers kind of thing, whereas these two units, especially with this, how they perform today, I think they're going to become everyday drivers for me. I just need to wait for uh, the delivery person to bring my coax cables so I can hook these up. But uh, my next challenge, which I will do off camera, because I'm going to probably end the video here. This will be part one. The next thing we'll do is I'll get a scope and uh, we'll start working on doing alignment. And I will, uh, my initial plan is to do an alignment with one or both of these units. I want to keep it to one if possible, because I know it's a pretty tall ask for somebody to uh, grab both of these. We'll try to do it. And, and I may do it with both. If, there, if there's interest there, let me know in the comments. But what we'll do is we'll do an alignment with the scope, and then I will check and see how close I got it with the actual scope cal gear. And we'll go from there. But um, at least for my initial impressions, having, having just opened these up, first used them, not even reading the manual, I think these are going to be decent additions to the lab. But as always, time will tell. More is always on the way, and I will see everybody in the next video.